everybody, and uh, welcome back to part eight of our study on the Shroud of Turin. This is going to be the second and final part on the paint, traditional painting hypothesis as laid out by Walter McCrony. And if you remember last time, uh, in, the, in part seven, we finished off all of the relevant fe minimal relevant feature analysis for the painting hypothesis and, and how it performs in relation to all of those the various features. And this time we saved one for last, and this is uh, MRF number seven, uh, additional feature number three. Um, so this basically says that the Shroud of Turin's body Im and bloodstain images are not composed of any paints, pigments, or binding mediums that, uh, you know, of any, even modern, but basically medieval or earlier. It's, it's not uh, composed of any of those substances. And that's what we're going to be establishing today. And I wanted to save it, uh, the majority, for a separate podcast because there is a heck of a lot of, of data here. I, I'm actually, it's just impossible for me to cover everything. Um, so I am, I'm trying to cover in as much as I can. Um, but yeah, there, there will be some stuff inevitably left out. The vast, vast majority of that is stuff that helps me and destroys the Shroud Skeptic. So you want to claim, oh, you're biased, you forgot this one little thing, or, or you left out this particular detail or nuance of an argument or something, these are all, I would say about 99% of them are stuff that I'm leaving out that would help me and hurt you as a Shroud skeptic. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to fit in as much as I can, and there's a lot to go over because there is evidence, good scientific evidence, on both sides of this question. So let's get into it. Let's not waste time. So. Okay, uh, so just have a, to start off, uh, in terms of, Sturp has determined that scientifically that there are no painting substances or foreign substances that make up the Shroud's body images and or bloodstain image. To quote Barry Schwartz, uh, regarding the painting hypothesis, he says, quote unquote, science itself has proven, 100% proven, and I don't use that word lightly, that the Shroud is not an artwork of any kind. Our, the Sturp team went to Turin to answer a single question. How is the image on the shroud formed? The conventional wisdom in 1978 was that it was either some form of painting, scorch, or photograph. So our tests included experiments to explore extensively all of these uh, possibili artistic possibilities. Using very sensitive spectral and chemical analyses, along with microscopic and photographic examination, we, uh, the Sturp team, uh, searched diligently for any traces of paints or pigments on the cloth. In fact, we had with us a complete catalogue of the spectral characteristics of every single paint and pigment used by man from ancient to medieval and up to through to the modern times. Uh, at, that, at that time, 1978. In the end, we determined that no such paints or pigments were responsible for the image. Thus, we proved scientifically. I guess Barry likes to, to talk like me there, Alan. I know you don't like putting scientifically proven together, but, uh, you know, tough. That's, that's, what, <laughs> that's the way we talk. Um, but, yeah, so they proved scientifically that the shroud image is not a painting. Boom. And this is coming from Barry Schwartz. He was a skeptic going into this thing. He was Jewish, but you know, very liberal. He grew up Orthodox Jewish, but he was an agnostic. He didn't believe in God, really, at the time he was contacted with this. He thought the shroud was obviously a fake. They would go there, spend a couple minutes, and prove it. You know, oh, there's the paint. We can go home. Um, basically, he just took part, part in it to get a free trip to Italy. Little did Barry know that the evidence uh, would prove the exact opposite. However, we also have another per uh, scientist, um, a qualified scientist, with some reputable data, scientific data, who was associated with Sturp, Walter McCrony. And he said something different. He actually studied actual shroud samples provided to him by Ray Rogers, um, who was a Sturp, the Sturp uh, chemist, the leader of the chemistry um, division there. And using polarized light microscopy, or PLM technology, he claimed to have proven absolute proof. The exact opposite was the case. He, he pointed to no less than four different categories of evidence, uh, or what I'm calling pro-paint observations for this potential counterfeature, 
which he claimed absolutely proved that the shroud had been painted using a red ochre or iron oxide pigment in a proteinous gelatin medium and that the blood had subsequently been touched up by red verme- uh, red vermilion or uh, Venetian rouge pigment. So yeah, the, what are these four categories of potential count- propane uh, counter features? Well, number one, it's been scientifically documented that there is iron on the shroud, including in the image areas, or uh, sorry, uh, well, in the image areas, and Walter McCrony says only in, in the image areas. Uh, there's tests for proteins that tested positive. So that's, you know, every paint has to be in a, a, a medium. Um, and he said, well, it's a gelatin proteinous, so we would detect proteins, right, if it's that gelatin medium. There's also various optical properties of the image fibers, which indicated to him that there is these paints or pigments being used. And finally, he did a, um, a few tests uh, that tested negative for the presence of blood. So, you know, that's not really proving that it's paint, but it's saying, well, hey, it's not blood, indicating, well, what else could it be other than paint? So, yeah, you know, obviously there's a contradiction between the experts. They all took part in the same STIRP experiment, although Macroni came on afterwards. He didn't actually go to Turin, but he did study actual samples. You know, he has valid scientific data that STIRP scientists recognize and say, yeah, you, you found some facts. We have this con- contradiction. You know, let, we need to get to the bottom of this, right? Just to summarize, so what did the STIRP scientists say? They, they say, quote unquote, the fibers are only colored yellow to light brown due to chemical reactions involving polyacerides. Uh, so that's, you know, comprising the linen fibers themselves. They've been oxidized or dehydrated and conjugation. So that it's, it's this exact same process of when your newspaper turns yellow after being left out in the sun. That's what they say is the color. Furthermore, they go on to describe that the colored linen fibers are only colored due to a chemical reaction involving these fibers themselves. There's no evidence of any coating or extraneous material added to the fibers to cause the image color. Yeah, uh, just a note on that, there, there is some controversy here. Some some shroud experts like Ray Rogers or Barry Schwartz, they, they say, well, actually the color is from staining, some kind of staining, like an acid stain or something like that. With the issue of the presence of detectable paint on the shroud's image bearing Fibrils. Like I said, there's a battery of tab. We have reflectance spectra data, chemical tests, laser microprobe, uh, Raymond spectra, pyrolysis max spectrometry, x ray fluorescence. Uh, you know, all of these show that the image was not painted with any of the expected hist- historically documented pigments. Likewise, all of the chemical tests showed that they're performed by STIRP, showed that there was no protein uh, painting medium or protein-containing coating in the body image areas. Furthermore, the image fibers do not show any sign of capillary flow as as we would expect from a reactive liquid like a paint or a pigment. And there are no pigments on the body image areas in sufficient quantity to explain the presence of an image. And the body image coloring cannot be dissolved, bleached, or changed by various chemical agents, which would be expected if it really was paint, except that it can be decolored by demide or a hydrazine or hydrogen peroxide. You know, um, basically the, the residue from reduction is colorless um, with the linen fibers when you use that. Tab. Yeah, so, you know, it can be reasonably concluded based on this that there are no organic nor inorganic paints or pigments and or gelatin binding mediums used in creating the shroud's images. What, what is, uh, uh, let's get into detail then about these various evidences. And the first thing to mention is, pri- you know, centuries before st- Stir, back in 1532, we actually have our first natural experiment that happened uh, back when there was a raging fire that affected the shroud. You know, the, some of the silver from the case burnt some holes. We have those scorch marks on the shroud today, and um, it burned right through the cloth. Thank goodness most of the images were left intact. But yeah, there, there was this natural experiment. Well, if it was made of paint, uh, the extremely high temperatures would have caused noticeable differences in the body image and blood stain areas if it really was paint. However, there are no noticeable differences between body image areas which are near to the scorch marks compared to ones further away. This indicates that it's not paint. 
uh, because we would have those differences if it were. You know, also the the shroud was doused with water to help you know get get out the the heat, get out the fire or whatever. And amazingly, the body images did not run off or or the color didn't migrate. Again, you would expect that if the images were actually composed of paints or pigments like Macroni and the, these uh, shroud skeptics like to claim. Macroni, of course, he was aware of this and he realized that he needs to address it. And so he, he kind of retorted in a sort of hand-waving gesture. He's just, he said, quote unquote, the cloth was folded as it was into a pad of 48 layers thick. Uh, and because of this, it is such a good insulator that the linen fibers... Uh, the tempera medium and red pigments uh, showed no visible effects of the fire except in one charred corner along one edge. But yeah, so so this is his answer, is that, well, they were spared from the heat because they were folded and they were insulated, and that's why we have no detectable differences. But, you know, Macroni, he, he's overlooking some of the subtleties here. I mean, in the first place, there are no noticeable differences in areas that were closer to scorch or burn holes than image areas further away from such locations. Remember that silver melted and burned right through the cloth. It doesn't matter how much it was folded up, those some areas would not be insulated from the heat in those locations, and we would still expect noticeable differences. You know, the number of folded layers can't insulate the images from something burning right through the cloth. What's more, Macroni just completely oblivious and doesn't mention uh, the fact of the water dousing and uh, the expected impact on his paint, alleged paint, that we would expect there. You know, the color migration or, or this runoff effect that we should see but yet don't with the shroud. So, yeah, I, I think this natural experiment is already suggestive before we even enter Sturp or Macroni's studies. This is something to think about. Yeah, let's let's get into the actual, you know, the the big study here. What what are some of these tests that Sturp um that Sturp did, as well as Macroni. So in the first place, we have various physical and spectral studies. These were performed on the body images, the blood marks, as well as the non-image areas of the Shroud of Turin back in 1978. And to explain how spectral studies, you know, how that works, basically everything in the universe is composed of oscillating particles. They can either emit, absorb, or reflect various forms of electromagnetic energy, or EM energy, right? Radiation, sorry. And really only a very narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum is visible to the human eye, visible light. But obviously scientists have devised various methods and tests uh, to detect non-visible EM waves as well. You know, things like x-rays, gamma rays, uh, ultraviolet or infrared radiation and light. You know, we, we now know that every chemical element has a very distinctive, what's called a spectral fingerprint. These can be objectively measured and identified using various sophisticated scientific equipment. These tests include ones able to detect the various chemical elements contained in paints, pigments, and dyes. Oh, we have a way of testing if these paints and pigments are actually there spectrally. So, yeah, if Macroni's suggestions were actually there, pigments that Macroni and his ilk like to say are there, these shroud skeptics, we should be able to detect them using these devices. Guess what? They all failed. None of them found any evidence uh, for this. So, you know, let's go into some detail. What happened with, first of all, we had a couple of x-ray tests using x-ray um, spectral tests. And the first was the x-ray fluorescence testing. This is the single most important spectral test to detect inorganic or metallic elements with an atomic weight greater than 16. These include inorganic paints and pigments that are typically found in medieval art, including the ones Macroni claimed to have proven are on the shroud, iron oxide or the red ochre, which is, and the red vermilion pigments, so that has mercury. Yeah, so, you know, if, if these images contain, are composed of these metals, this X-ray fluorescence test should have tested positive for these the presence of these metals. And although that 27 various spectra were detected using this test on the shroud, the vast majority of these elements were clearly not present in sufficient enough concentrations to create the shroud's Im shroud images. You know, Macroni himself said, yeah, they, these are all just contamination and meaningless. However, uh, there were three such metals that were detected, strontium, calcium and iron iron oh didn't macrone say iron oxide pigment 
You betcha. So this is going to be our first counter feature. There are uniform amounts of iron detected on the shroud, including image areas and non-image areas. But Macroni says it's just the image areas. This is what proves it's an iron oxide or red ochre pigment. So yeah, th this is our first propate observation. This is undeniable science. Macroni is right. And Sterp confirmed it with x-ray fluorescence testing. There are these, you know, there is this iron on the shroud. The, the calcium and strontium is irrelevant. No, nobody you know, those are present on the shroud, but they're not, they're not uh, you know, proposed to be part of any pigments or anything like that. It's really the iron that we need to focus on. That's the point of controversy. As I said, Sterp discovered that this iron is actually found to be uniform on both body image areas and non-image areas of, the, of the, the cloth. And this is interesting because there should be noticeable differences in the concentrations of iron of the iron in the body images compared to the non-image areas if it was actually composed of an iron oxide pigment. Yet it's not, and Macroni was completely oblivious to this. He he didn't know that the x-ray fluorescence testing had proven this. So he just kind of looked through his microscope and he saw iron oxide on a body image sample. He saw iron and iron oxide, he said, oh, uh, that proves it's, it's painted. He, he, didn't bother finding out about some of the other tests proving that there were uniform amounts of iron in non-body image areas. So yeah, I don't think the discovery of the iron on the shroud would seem to support the conclusion that an iron oxide paint was used to create these body images. But still, it, it is present on the shroud. Why, why would this be the case? Why would we have find iron, uh, uniform amounts of iron on the shroud? Well, these iron concentrations, there, there are a few different ways, but this is, I'm just going to give this one for the sake of time. This is what I think it is mostly, and it's basically, it can be completely accounted for by the retting process. So this was the preferred process used in ancient times to manufacture linen. Same with medieval times as well, up until those times. Um, and it was basically you submerge the flax plants in a body of water, usually your local pond, and this would allow the useless part of the flax to rot away during a lengthy period of time. However, as part of that process, unbeknownst to us, various inorganic elements, such as iron, would then be absorbed and chemically bonded within the liberal sorry, bound within the linen fibrils. You know, Ster Sterp even tested various control samples of other linen cloths uh, used from ancient to modern times, you know, all known to have been created using this reading process, and every single one of them had the exact same similar levels of calcium, strontium, and iron contained within their fibrils, as was discovered by the, on the shroud. Now, just to sort of qualify this iron finding, because there are three different forms of iron that were found on the shroud. Another one was a heme-bound iron. So that's that's the iron that's found in, in the blood stains. Coincidentally, this is the same iron we have in human blood, right? We, we have iron in our blood. So we would expect to find iron in the blood stains if it was composed of real human blood. As I said, there was also this specific form of iron oxide that was found through the redding process that Macroni claimed was proof for this iron oxide pigment. Now here, here's the thing. With the iron oxide specifically, most of these, these red particles and coatings were actually found in the water stains margins, uh, as well as around these scorch marks or adjacent to the blood stains, as opposed to in the body image or, or in the blood stains directly themselves. This would directly contradict Macrone because we would expect the opposite to be the case if they were actually painted with an iron oxide pigment. Yeah, the, the presence of iron oxide or, or you know, various forms of iron specifically on the shroud, admittedly inconclusive at best. There are at least four possible explanations for this. One, Macrone was right. He, there is an iron earth pigment or red ochre paint that was used to create the ore too. Iron oxide formed in the burned blood through a well-known reaction and later migrated through the water stain. Three, iron contained in the water used to extinguish the 1532 fire allowed for iron oxide to be produced in the form of the bi biofringin red particles that were observed by Macroni. There's also iron getting on the shroud from the redding process, as I've mentioned. However, there, there is one thing that uh, some shroud skeptics have mentioned, and actually Giulio Fonte, a pro-shroud proponent, 
has suggested this as well, that well, it could be that some of the bloodstains have been actually uh, touched up at some point in the Shroud's history with a red paint of some kind, you know, in order to make it more dramatic for display purposes. It, it's possible that some of the bloodstains do actually have paint on them. Um, and Giulio Fonte suggested this. However, this option won't account for all of, you can't use this to account for all of them, for sure. Um, and I don't even, there's no specific proof that this, this is true for any of them. It's just a speculation that, you know, Fonte is trying to cover his bases and say, well, let, let's say we do actually get confirmation that there is actually paint here, then okay, well, some medieval, some Renaissance artist touched up uh, like two or three of the bloodstains. That's that's irrelevant. That doesn't mean it was a painted image. But yeah, let, let's be honest. The presence of the iron, it's it's just too inconclusive to decide any option, really. It, it's just, you have to admit, there is this iron on there, including iron oxide, but it's, it's too vague to be able to say it's painted or no, it's, it's not painted just based on the presence of, of this iron itself. Going further though, there is actually an additional problematic discovery made about the shrouds, bloodstains in particular. There has there was no potassium that was detected using this x-ray fluorescence testing, that, that at least that were associ associated with the calcium and iron deposits. This is a problem because blood has potassium in it. So here, here's Macrone, ever so smug. Let's see what he has to say. I enjoy heisting Sterp with their own petard. I, I can't help noting that Sterp not only ignores much of, the, much of my data, but even some of their own. If they don't find potassium with the iron and calcium, taint blood. And Sterp admitted this. Yeah, no, no potassium signals could be found in any of the blood area data. This is somewhat a problematic thing at face value if you want to say this is blood, right? Sterp scientists have addressed this oddity, either by postulating that the low levels of potassium are explainable either due to the shroud's blood stains not being whole blood, you know, blood, blood as it flowed out of a living human, as opposed to merely blood exudates, this is from Alan Ad Adler, or by proposing that perhaps there was a poor signal to noise ratio that precluded definite conclusions on this point in, in how, you know, Macrone came to his conclusion that there's no potassium found on the shroud. These are the two options. Pro-shroud advocates that believe that it is made of blood have to counter this finding that there's no potassium in these areas, and these are equally valid. I'm, I'm sorry, skeptics, you're not allowed. You, you don't know. You can't, unless you can prove these options didn't happen, then you just have to be agnostic as to this finding of the no potassium. Um, but I, I will admit that is something at face value that's problematic and needs to be addressed. Next, our final x-ray test is the x-ray absorption radiographs, or, or x-ray low energy radiography. And these tests were conducted to detect the density levels of the various elements found on the shroud. You know, more dense materials tend to absorb more of the x-rays which are directed at them, whereas less dense elements, you know, any, any heavy elements used to create images should be detectable using this technology. Yet, compared to the water stains with the, uh, and the chest wound area, um, which it, that's the area on the shroud that has the highest concentration of blood, uh, at least vis that's visible with the naked eye. Basically, the, the visibly denser chest wound on, on didn't register at all uh, using this technology. That's weird. That's the opposite of what you would expect if it was painted using an iron oxide or, or red vermilion. Uh, pigments that Macroni suggested he found. So just as a caveat though, the reported sensitivity to iron oxide specifically, it, it's not sufficient using this test to completely eliminate the possibility of iron oxide pigments or vermilion being present in the blood stain. So this, this test in isolation isn't conclusive, but it is an indicator that you need to be aware of. And it's something we would normally expect to have shown up if it was painted. So next, we also have ultraviolet fluorescence testing and ultraviolet reflectance spectrum spectroscopy. So as I, I mentioned before, the non-image area fluoresces, but the body images do not fluoresce in the visible under ultraviolet illumination. Furthermore, the blood 
also does not fluoresce in ultraviolet illumination. However, as I said, these all of a sudden invisible scourge marks, scratches, and serum attraction rings suddenly appear in ultraviolet light around these things. So basically these aspects are important in establishing truth uh, of um, this feature because all paints and pigments need to use a binding medium of some kind. You know, Macroni suggested he discovered a common medieval gelatin binding medium on the Shroud's uh, body and bloodstain images, which he thinks subsequently yellowed with time, sort of staining the cloth. And that's the color that we see today. It's not actually the paint with the body images, at least. It's this staining that, that's left over. And that's that's what we see with the body images today. Of course, all of the paint just happened to miraculously go away from the body images, but not from the blood stains. The paint stayed with the blood stains. You know, get real skeptic. But anyways, um, medieval pigment binders were usually made of some kind of animal part. And animal parts contain proteins in them. Um, and obviously proteins contain amino acids. Now, here's the problem, Mr. Skeptic, because proteins are, and amino acids are known to fluoresce quite strongly when placed under ultraviolet illumination. But yet, the body images and the blood stains do not fluoresce under ultraviolet light. This strongly implies that there is no protein byproducts like a collagen binder that was present in these areas. Yeah, this, this is another indicator that uh, the Shroud skeptics out to lunch here. Um, Crony messed up. Likewise with the UV reflectance studies, um, this showed that the spectra of the Shroud images are very similar to slightly scorched areas on the Shroud. This implies that the images are closer to a scorched image rather than a painted one. Nevertheless, it is true that there are some differences in the UV reflectance curves between the two, between the scorches and the body image areas. So it does make it hard to make any definitive conclusions based on this aspect alone. But again, this is just one of those other indicators. Whatever it is, it, it's not exactly like a scorch, but it's, it's close based on these UV reflectance curves. Um, certainly much closer to a scorch than it is to any painted image. Next, we have infrared or thermography tests. These tests were conducted to detect elements in the far infrared region of the EM spectrum. And what happened after conducting these tests is that neither vermilion nor iron oxide pigments, nor any other pigments for that matter, were found uh, to be used to create the shroud's bloodstain images. For the more thermal photography, which is handy in exposing elements used in things like oil, um, you know, acrylic, tempera, which is what Macroni is suggesting, it's a tempera paint, uh, or watercolor paintings. This is what this test is good for in detecting this. Again, these tests all failed to detect the use of any types of these paints. Jeez, it's not looking good for you skeptics, is it? Next, we have a laser microprobe Raymond spectrograph. This device ascertains the chemical composition and molecular structure of a given object. Also, a mass spectrograph measures the mass of individual atoms. Both of these tests were used on the Shroud's body images. Neither detected the presence of any inorganic substances nor any other foreign material, even in residual trace amounts. Not even residual trace amounts were left. Incredible. Jeez, I don't know what this, you know, shroud skeptics can say to something like this, but obviously this would be unexpected, at the very least an unexpected and very odd find if the body images were indeed painted. Pyrolysis mass spectrometry was also a highly sensitive uh, method that was used to detect small amounts of non-carbohydrate organic materials, you know, things that could have been used in a painting substance. No contaminant was found on the image samples, neither pigment nor nitrogen-containing material like proteins, you know, if, if in, such as with a proteinous uh, gelatin binder. None of these were found on the shroud samples. There is one caveat here, and it's interesting. Remember the raised sample that I mentioned in 1973? This did show a significant content of what are called pentosans, or plant gum. But it, th this substance itself was completely absent from all the other shroud samples. Uh, so this is just indicate another indication that it's simple contamination. And, you know, kind of, ooh, this, this is another thing that shows that that area is non-representative of the rest of the shroud. The same area these 1988 carbon-14 dating scientists took their shroud sample from. Kind of a problem, guys. 
anyways, uh, moving on. We also have FTIR and UV microspectroscopy. So uh, basically, FTIR spectra of the shroud fibers were used on the body image samples, and they showed none of the characteristic amide bands of a proteinous material. So there's no evidence for proteins. Let's keep it simple there. The spectra from the UV and the FTIR are both consistent and similar to blood and serum samples used on the various human blood control samples that STIRP used to compare with the shroud samples using these uh, these uh, spectral tests. Yeah, I just want to be honest. This this covers all of the spectral tests, and I have to admit that none of these various spectral tests in isolation are sufficient to completely rule out the use of some kind of paint or pigment. There's always an excuse that a sh- desperate shroud skeptic can make up to ex- try to explain away these these tests. None of them are individually conclusive. Taken together, the cumulative weight of all these spectral tests put together, geez, the, this makes it improbable that you're going to be able to find any substance that can get past all these tests. This just makes it much more probable than not that it, whatever whatever these images, body images and blood stains are, they're not paint. Um, you have to go against all of these spectroscopical tests. However, let's let's be fair. Our our second here's our second pro paint pro paint counter feature. Remember, I said I'm talking about all these tests. None of them are finding proteins. Well, Macroni did his own tests for proteins. He got positive results. He said he discovered proof that there were proteins, um, and this proved the existence of his gelatin paint medium was used uh, to apply the pigment that he was um, the red iron or iron oxide pigment. So in order to prove the existence of proteins on the Shroud's images, Macroni used what was what's called the standard amido black test, and he got a positive result using this. And this was the really the main basis for his claim of, of proving that there's a proteinous medium. It's proof that the Shroud was, was painted using this gelatin binding medium. Now, just so you know, an amido black test will cause any proteins on a fiber to stain blue. So that's how you identify it. If it stains blue, then proteins are there. Crony himself observed and documented during his investigation using three shroud blood sample tapes. That's it, just three. He didn't, by this point, he didn't have all the other samples that had been given to someone else to back to STIRP, other STIRP scientists for their analysis. Um, but he, he was able to test three blood samples that he possessed using this amido black test. And yeah, he, he didn't use this at all on any body image samples. Yet, of course, he arrogantly assumes that, well, if it's in the blood stains, it's gotta be in the body images as well. That proves they're both painted. That's an assumption, Macroni, come on. But yeah, even Macroni himself, he admits that this test alone is insufficient, you know, to further specify what exactly this finding of proteins might entail. There are various proteinaceous substances, right? Blood has proteins in it. (laughs) So yeah, of course you would expect to find proteins in the blood stains. This doesn't prove that it's a gelatin binding medium. It could prove it's blood. Both are equally possible given this finding, this amido black test. Macroni knew this and okay, he did his due diligence a little bit here. He said, okay, well, I'm gonna apply an additional test. He applied the standard PMA, uh, so PMA stands for the pigment medium agglomerates, uh, iodine or sodium iodide test. And this is to determine if the catalytic decomposition of the sodium iodide in this aqua- aqueous solution gave forth bubbles of nitrogen gas. Okay, wow, why is that important? Well, if it does give off nitrogen bubbles, sorry, yeah, if there was no cysteine present in the Shroud's bloodstain images, then he can eliminate the presence of real human blood in these areas and feel confident that, well, the only thing left is my gelatin solution. You know, a collagen tempera watercolor paint must have been employed to create these blood stain images then. And it's because blood blood will, will produce this vigorous um, effervescence of, of nitrogen bubbles. You know, and so we would expect a lot of bubbles to to be present if it was really blood. Macroni discovered, well, not a lot of bubbles. I, I guess it's not blood. This proves that these proteins must be from the gelatin uh, binding medium in my paint. Proof positive, I win uh, kind of thing. That, that's the way 
Macron, that's what Macroni did with these results. On the other hand, STIRP scientists, doctors Heller and Adler, some of the world's experts, so is Macroni, but they found that the amido black tests can also equally stain weak cellulostic material or artificially aged linen, such as the shroud cloth itself. The fact that Macroni, again, he readily acknowledges this is the case. He, he doesn't dispute this is true in his own book. But Macroni does respond by claiming that the STIRP didn't understand how this test is supposed to work. You know, the blue stain, the excess regent, or this blue stain, um, has to be subsequently washed away with a dilute acidic acid in order to produce conclusive results. So Macroni accuses STIRP of being completely oblivious of this to this and ignoring that fact. You know, he, he also additionally used what's called a fusion or other protein regions getting pro positive results in his um, scientific investigation. However, this is just nonsense on Macroni's part. Heller and Adler were well aware of these facts and they actually, you know, took efforts to short circuit the inclusiveness, uh, inconclusiveness of this kind of test. Um, by demonstrating that the resulting blue stain from the amido black test cannot be removed by proteasis. Now, this is conclusive. This proteasis test, Macroni was totally ignorant of it, but this demonstrates absolute proof that the color was not bound to proteins, but more likely to uh, carbonyl cellulistic groups. Uh, so, you know, to the, the cellulose itself. You know, this is a classical test for the detection of proteins, you know, at the macro level. What's more, even at the microscopic level, STIRP performed eight different types of tests using different reactants uh, for protein detection. They used multiple control samples, which Macroni didn't. They also used the, you know, things like the fluoresamine test. This is specific enough for protein detection, and it's highly sensitive, so it can render results at the nano to pictogram level in conditions of the shroud. It's very specific. I know th this this podcast is very going to be very technical and it's probably not going to make a lot of sense, but uh, hopefully I'm translating a bit little bit here, but still giving you the details of what these tests are and the specifics of what was found. But um, okay, here, here's what you should remember. So this proteasis test that STIRPS performed, this is conclusive. This is quote-unquote absolute proof that Macroni is full of it. It's not a protein gelatin uh, binding medium because these were used on both the body image and non-image fibrils and they showed absolutely no effect when this proteasis test was used. This contrasts the exact opposite was observed when STIRP used this specific test on the painted control samples. All of them found that the color was dissolved completely and quickly without any visible residue of the colored materials left present on the fibrils. Macrone didn't, didn't test the body images uh, for proteins. Heller and Adler did test these fibers with an absolute proof a proteasis solution. So yeah, th this is proof positive 100%. There's no doubt that the body image fibers do not contain any proteins at all, but the blood fibers do, as you would expect. Blood has proteins in it. So checkmate shroud skeptics with this prote proteasis test, you lose. T pick up your cards, go home, Macroni was wrong. It's not, the body images are not painted, whether you like it or not. 100% proven, you're wrong. What else did Macroni do? Well, he, he also performed a standard test for sulfur containing uh, amino acid. So he used, to, he used this test just on one single fiber of a one blood sample. He did use controls. He had two controls of, of real blood particles and two fibers covered with recently dried blood. Remember that, recent. Um, whereas the blood on the shroud is ancient or medieval. It's centuries old, so it's not a direct comparison right there. This is an example of where Macroni is incompetent or makes amateurish mistakes in his conclusions. But yeah, th this test, it's actually more apt for use in assessing particles rather than the fibers themselves. And given that the particular fiber Macrone used was actually very close to a scorch mark, the negative of ta the negative result that was obtained by Macrone is completely meaningless. You, you can't use it to determine anything. Yeah, you know, basically Macrone only applied this test to tiny amounts, tiny amounts of the shroud sample. And um, 
this it, it's centuries old material this this blood or paint whatever you want to call it is is centuries old you know th- this is just not the way you do science this is this result is just complete garbage you need to throw it out macroni didn't conduct the proper rigor in this scientific method with the he, had, he used bad samples the recent blood and um he used it on a single sample again it, you know a lot of these shroud skeptics seem to, to make bad decisions, you know, uh, one sample over multiple samples, bad control, not the following proper scientific protocols. Um, there's, a, there's a common trend, I, I think, developing with some of these shroud skeptics. Also, he didn't test body image fibers at all, but yet he concluded there's absolute proof that the body images were painted. So, yeah, Macroni's claims have been have uh, basically proven, you know, where Macroni's claims, where he says there, there's proof that there's a collagen binder on the image fibers, is complete and utter rubbish. Um, you're a fool if you believe that these are true. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. But Sterp's not done. We we also had various microscopic and chemical tests uh, to prove that the shroud is not painted as well that Sterp scientists uh, use to determine the composition of the images. So in the first place, they did various tests for organic dyes, materials, and stains. You know, Sterp determined that the straw yellow coloring of the shroud's body images were not the result of an application of any organic materials, dyes, or stains. And okay, well, how did they do this? Well, the color of all organic painting mediums can be classified as being part of being one of three main categories of organic coloring agents. The first type, they change color when uh, in a bat acid or base. B, the color of the image will change due to oxidization, oxidation or reduction. And finally, three, uh, the color can be extracted with an organic solvent. And Sterp chemists uh, Dr. John Heller and Alan Adler uh, conducted various microchemical experiments on the body image for barrels to test uh, for the possible use of all three types of the possible organic coloring agents known to man. All of them conclusively tested negative for the presence of these painting mediums. Uh, in total, 21 different solvents were used on image-bearing fibrils, and only dimide, which is a powerful reducing agent, and hydrazine were able to remove the color of the image, uh, leaving behind you know a colorless intact fiber. So yeah, this it it's this is absolute proof. It is not an organic dye material or stain. Uh, that's responsible for the image color on the shroud. However, is that a problem for the painting hypothesis or Walter Macroni? No, because he didn't he didn't claim it was an organic dye. He claimed it was an inorganic pigment. So uh, enter Sterp. They also did various chemical tests for inorganic pigments, including iron oxide or red ochre and the red vermilion paints that Macrone claimed he discovered the shroud images were made of. And this included extensive microscopic investigations or microchemical investigations to determine if such organic inorganic pigments were used. They used high-powered microscopes uh, and meticulously surveyed all of the shroud's image-bearing fibrils at different levels of high magnification, up to 1,000 times. They used light, polarization, and phase contrast microscopes, a little bit more than Macroni with his, just using his little PLM microscope. But yeah, all of these examinations yielded negative results for the use of all inorganic paints and pigment compounds. However, remember, I did say that there were some metallic elements discovered on the shroud. Remember that iron, calcium, and strontium. As I said, that, that's not a problem. These elements can be readily accounted for in, in naturalistic ways, and they're not responsible for the images because they're in uniform amounts throughout the entirety of the cloth. What's more, though, the, what's more interesting is that the fibrils of the body image regions were proven to be completely uncoated with any foreign substances, even the joints of the threads themselves were still visible. This could not be the case if any kind of paint or pigment had been used, and uh, is a big problem for you shroud skeptics and uh, Macroniites. If you want to just mindlessly believe what Macroni tells you to believe, how do you explain this scientifically proven fact that the, there's no paints even in the joints of the threads 
impossible. However, there's um, of the body images. Um, however, Macroni has, here's the third part of the propane counter features that Macroni had his own optical observations which supported the use of paint. And Walter Macroni, he, he claimed to have found iron oxide and red vermilion pigment particles on the shroud's body and bloodstained images, you know, using his, his PLM, his polarized light microscope, as well as another ta- scientific test. And on the other hand, STIRP scientists Heller and Adler, using the same samples, concluded that no such particles were present in sufficient quantity to account for the body or blood stain images. Once again, looks like we have a contradiction from the experts, uh, opposite conclusions being reached. So how do we make sense of this optical data or these optical propaint observations that Macroni is claiming here. So just understand, there are three op- main optical properties for any object when you're looking at it through a microscope. Number one is its refractive index or uh, index of refraction. And this is the ratio of the velocity of light in a vacuum relative to the velocity of light in a medium, such as a liquid paint. There's also isotropy versus anisotropy. And this refers to substances that have one, isotropy, or more than one, anisotropy, refractive index, uh, or indices. And then three, there's birefringence. And uh, this is really just the numerical difference between the maximum and minimum refractive indices of any anisotropic substance. So, McCrony did some testing here, and he used these indices to prove that the blood stains on the shroud were not blood, but paint based on the refractive index. Blood is an isotropic material. It's not birefringent. Um, you know, it usually has a reflective index of less than 1.60. Anisotropic material like crystals or pure hematite, as would be expected in a red ochre paint, they are birefringent. They have reflective indices above 2.5 tip. Yeah, it's crucial to know that some iron oxide pigment particles, with, with the exception of hematite, may actually be isotropic, just like blood. And therefore, they might not be birefringent. But um, yeah, with, with these different iron oxide pigments, they give different results under these tests. So here, here's a quote. So the, the true test, which distinguishes iron oxide particles or birefringent or not from organic particles like blood is the measure of the uh, refractive index. And Macroni claimed that the refractive index indices of a single shroud blood sample, that's all he tested. That's, that's all just one. And again, in fairness, that's all he had because all the other samples were taken from him at this point. But still, if you're a true scientist, you don't make conclusions off one blood sample. Poor, sloppy science, Macroni. Um, but anyways, he did test this, and he found out that it didn't have a sufficiently low ref- uh, refractive index to be identified as blood. It was actually a- approximately double that that would be expected if it were blood, being close to somewhere around the 3.0 level, just like what would be expected with a red ochre and or vermilion pigment. Case closed. Here's the proof again. It's, it's a pigment, right, Shroud Skeptic? No, not so fast, because... This result was more a product of Macroni's incompetence and flawed methodology. There's your ad hominems again, Dale, right? Nope, uh, here's what I'm talking about. So the, this data was not based on a reflection of the true index of the sample particles themselves. Macroni made a very amateurish mistake when he was analyzing these particles. When he looked at them through the microscope, they were still stuck to the Mylar backing tape that was used to remove them from the shroud originally. And, I mean, this this is just common sense, skeptics. I mean, come on, think, put two and two together. If, if it's still on the, the sticky tape, the Mylar backing tape, well, it will always result in the illusion of birefringent particles because the light will pass through, sorry, the, the light will pass through both sides of the sticky tape in addition to the red particle itself and it will give deceptively high refractive index values. This is just common sense. Macroni missed out. Shroud skeptics, please don't follow suit. Put two and two together. This is not good data. Macroni messed up here. Um, so yeah, the evidence for that for this is just based on the refractive index is complete garbage. Throw it out. It should be completely ignored. 
And quite frankly, it's baffling that uh, some qualified science like Macroni would have such sloppy methods and then shroud skeptics just mindlessly believe him as, oh, he's a credible scientist. Yep, everything he says is great. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's he messed up here. You can't use this data at all. It's meaningless. Now, credible scientists and, and more careful STIRP scientists, Heller and Adler, on the other hand, they properly removed the samples from the Mylar tape and tested multiple samples, not just one, multiple for confirma- independent confirmation. They actually did, um, you know, following McCrony's suggestion, they actually also ad- um, conducted what's called a Beckline test on these particles as well. And using this uh, Beckline test, Heller and Adler very clearly distinguished between two different types of red particles. Some of them had refractive indices of 1.5 or more, Um, so this is consistent with Macroni's findings of iron oxide, but they also found other samples from the same image areas which showed no birefringence and had much lower refractive indices, less than 1.5 just like blood. It seems that the scientific data is that there are two very different kinds of red objects or particles, um, or, you know, the scientific terminology, agglomerates, agglomerates, which are present on the shroud in in these red-coated fibrils of the bloodstain images. This is, of course, a a fact that Macroni completely failed to recognize, but STIRP scientists being more rigorous actually proved was the case. Now, one one other thing about this bloodstain, and Macroni, basically, his, he had a team uh, at Macroni Associates, and they used what's called X-ray energy dispersive X-ray analysis, or uh, X-ray diffraction tests, on 11 blood image area shards. Uh, again, all of these were taken from that single sample. Uh, it, it's labeled 3CB. Um, so again, you're just using one sample. That's problematic. But yeah, so they used this. And um, they discovered something that kind of peeved off Macroni a little bit because he f- completely failed to, to notice this using his PLM method. And he was really angry that he, he missed this. But they, they found that some of the blood stains had mercury sulfide. So that's the pigment known as red vermilion or Venetian red. Much to uh, Macroni's chagrin, he didn't like this because he had this desperate attempt to prove that PLM technology could prove it all and was still relevant. It was known as the dinosaur. You know, it was an outdated technology from the 1950s, and Macroni was desperate to hang on to, you know, his beloved methods. But this kind of, you know, his own team kind of made him look like a fool um, because he totally missed this uh, red vermilion paint pigment that was proved proved to be there through this energy dispersive x-ray analysis as well as x-ray diffraction tests uh, done on the same sample. So yeah, Macroni didn't like that, but he eventually catered and said, well, this is what my team found. This is what the data is. So yep, I guess the bloodstains must have been touched up later on with this Venetian red pigment or red vermilion pigment. Now, STIRP, using this same technology, but this time on multiple samples from different areas of the shroud, not just that one sample, but multiple blood, body image, and non-image areas, Heller and Adler were able to prove conclusively that no mercury was found on any of the samples except on the track sample. Basically, this proves, well, red vermilion's on the shroud, and this can't be explained away naturally, like like the iron on the shroud and stuff. That The only way this this um, mercury, mercury sulfide or could be on the shroud is if a pigment, an inorganic pigment, red vermilion, was, was present on the shroud somehow. So, oops, is that a problem? No, because STIRP proved that it's not anywhere on the shroud except in one sample. Obviously, what does that mean? It means it's contamination and the blood samples are not composed of red vermilion uh, pigment, like Macroni, basically um, lied to the people based on one single sample. He deceitfully said it's proven they're all made from red. They were all touched up with red vermilion paint, going well beyond the data. But yeah, you know how how would such contamination take place easily? Um, throughout the shroud's known history, various paintings were placed on top of the shroud. Uh, this was to, you know, some kind of sanctification ceremony or something that Catholics did. And various paint pigments would get onto the shroud in that way. Don't believe me, shroud skeptics? Well, let me quote from your good buddy, Walter McCrony. He scientifically proved 
there is lots of contamination particles uh, present on the shroud. Things like various things like insect parts, uh, various plants, various pigments, bird feather fibers, wax spatters, even a modern felt tip pen mark was discovered on the shroud. Uh, pink nylon, um, silk. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's a scientifically proven fact that there are multiple contamination layers. That's what this red vermilion thing is. It, it's just contamination. It's scientifically proven that it's not responsible or in the other bloodstain areas. So, sorry, Shroud Skeptics, uh, another chalk up another failure for you guys here on this one. Um, but, yeah, just one, one last little note. Uh, Mark Antonucci has a very humorous way of, of describing uh, the outright ludicrousness of Shroud Skeptics like Macroni, who made this outrageous conclusion based on this erroneous method and one sample finding. And he says this, so, quote-unquote, to, to say that vermilion is a primary component of the Shroud's bloodstains in light of Sterp's conclusive proof to the contrary makes about as much sense as saying that the body images are composed of insect parts because some samples found insect legs and other insect parts in these body image areas. Uh, yeah, I think you get how ridiculous the skeptics are there. However, one last pro-paint counter feature that Macroni's results found. And these are, basically, he did specific tests for blood, and they all came out negative. Therefore, ha, I don't have to prove it's paint, but I can prove it's not blood. And if it's not blood, what else could it be? It must be paint, like what Macroni says, right? Wrong, Shroud Skeptics, wrong. I mean, I mean it's, you must be getting tired of being proven wrong so much all the time now, but... <laughs> I can picture Alan foaming at the mouth. <laughs> um, okay, so, yes. Yeah, so, um, and I, I'm just, I mean this in good fun. I'm, I'm trying to provoke you, Alan. I want, I want you know, you, you shroud skeptics to, to feel motivated to look into what I'm saying. But, yeah, you know, basically we have to remember at this point, with my MRF, I don't need to prove that it's blood. I don't, I don't care. I don't need that postulation. I'm just proving that it's not paint. So I could actually just ignore all of these tests. However, to be fair, because in a previous podcast, in part five, I believe, yeah, in part five, I did give some of the pro-blood evidence. And because I want to give you a comprehensive understanding, it's only fair that I that I mention the evidence that is against blood or against the possibility that these blood stain images are blood. So yeah, you, you know, I have to be fair to the Shroud skeptic on that front. So yeah, you know, Macroni, he performed some of the more us usual forensic tests for blood. Things like ben benzodyne or sulfuric acid, Takayama or Teichmann tests. All of these yielded negative results for blood. And thus he immediately pronounced, I can, quote unquote, I can say with absolute certainty that there's no blood on the Shroud. Anyone reporting blood is either deliberately deceiving himself and others, or is guilty of bad science. Whoa, quite the quote there, Macroni. Uh, geez, it, it's not blood? Um, all right, well, let's let's see what the actual STIRP scientists have to say, people that are more careful, because I don't trust you, Macroni. You, you mess up too much. I want to hear what the other side has to say. Well, Heller and Adler conceded that such tests do, in fact, yield negative results. What? They're, they're agreeing with you, Macroni? Okay, uh, I'm a little worried now. However, they surmise that such results could be due to the samples being inadequately solubilized. This is known to occur with aged or strongly denatured blood. You know, so they, they actually developed another method on top of this, um, which is not subject to, to the deficiencies that comes from old denatured blood. You know, based on the detection of pofferin, for example, a component of blood. This test... Um, taken with proper measures actually yielded positive results for porphyrin. You know, this is one of the proofs that it's actually blood. And to further substantiate the presence of blood on the shroud, Heller and Adler uh, also conducted a hemochromagin test to reveal the presence of hemoglobin, of uh, hemoglobin, sorry, again, with positive results. And they even tested for bile pigments with the Ehrlich Regent test, you know, using the same microspotting method, the characteristic uh, azobilirubin color of the blood could be detected on the shroud. So yeah, th this is conclusive. It's blood, people. Sorry, sorry, skeptics. Um, but still, Macroni did do these tests, and they did come up negative. 
Why is that the case? Well, the answer lies in the fact that all of Macroni's tests were using a control samples using recent blood samples. Again, this is in direct contrast to um, minute amounts of aged blood that we were able to f get on the shroud sample. So it wasn't a valid comparison. And, you know, given the effects of aging, uh, poor solubility, the lack of sufficiently sensitive methods or technology, you know, it's not surprising that uh, at least that Macroni's test did turn up these negative results. It would be expected and it doesn't prove a thing. Yeah, the, you know, the spectral studies uh, in, in conclusion, in terms of this additional feature, the, the spectral studies serve as an incredible indication of, of the conclusion that there is no paint or pigments. Again, in, in fairness, it has to be admitted that none of the spectral studies alone can completely elim eliminate the possibility of Macroni's proposed paint pigments, but cumulatively, that's another story. It, it, it does seem to rule that out. And much of the negative results obtained by STIRP uh, using this kind of equipment, it could be consistent with the presence of an aged collagen, you know, on the spectral spectral end. But uh, the discovery of no MI band being detectable using FTIR micro spectro spectrometry, uh, combined with the failure to remove the image color using that proteasis test. Remember, if if you, I know I've given you so much uh, technical jargon, but remember that proteasis test. This is the proof, absolute proof, 100%. The shroud's body images are not painted. There is no gel protein gelatin binding medium. You know, no pr proteinaceous substances or, or gelatin binding mediums were used to create the shroud's body images, period. No questions, all the other evidence, doesn't matter. Absolute proof, this is 100% proven. It's not paint. In relation to the blood stains, the spectral or physical studies did reveal that as with the body images, none of the tests came up with the results that could be said to conclusively disprove the use of Macroni's proposed paint pick. But by the same token, these tests are not conclusive enough to exclude the possibility of real blood uh, being used either in, a, in you know isolation based on these spectral tests. Yeah, remember the Shroud's blood stains would probably not be composed of whole blood. Uh, but rather blood exudates, and there is a difference there. And this can account for much of the alleged contradictory findings where Macroni is saying, you know, oh, I've got negative test results for blood. This this proves that it's not uh, blood and stuff like that. Um, you're going beyond the data, and you're not remembering that it's not recent blood. It's centuries-old blood. Plus, it's not whole blood. It is blood exudates. On that front, probably the single best indication or, or proof that the bloodstains are in fact composed of real blood and not paint really comes from the UV fluorescent studies, which you know revealed the existence of those invisible fluorescent halos or blood serum retraction ring. Really, that's that's the key ingredient for us that we can say, well, it's not paint. It can't be paint. It's impossible that a human artist in the medieval period or, or afterwards would have been able to paint those realistic serum retraction rings so that they're visible in the ultraviolet life, but in light, but invisible in person. I, I think that just rules it out. You know, as a, a shroud expert, and I'm going to give you his source here, uh, Thibault uh, Heimberger, he says, there is no way to observe such a spontane spontaneous behavior for a painting. Therefore, to obtain these fluorescent halos, the artist would have to spend hundreds of hours to deliberately paint them with a collagen which incidentally would not fluoresce in body image areas so that they would be invisible with the naked eye. You know, I'll let the, read, I'll let the reader, in this case, I'll let the listener, uh, decide for themselves the absolute nonsense of such a possibility. I know some, some Shroud skeptics actually, I, I'm not sure, like Darren seems to think this is possible. I, I just can't get it, but I, I think he, he understands that it's problematic, at least on a balance of probabilities. I'll, I'll find out, but um, yeah, like the, I'll, I'll let the listeners you decide. Do you honestly think this this is a plausible thing that some medieval artist painted these uh, invisible fluorescent halos with paint or a collagen? Uh, sorry, guys, I, I don't think so. Likewise, the optical and chemical results from microchemical analyses showed that the body image fibrils don't alter like we would expect if they were an externally applied paint or pigment. As to the blood stains, all, all of the credible tests for blood support Sterp's conclusion against Macroni 
that it is blood and it is not pain. You know, it's important to, to notice when it comes to the issue of scholarly credibility, Macroni himself has impugned the work of STIRP scientists on repeated occasions. And, you know, it's a bit rich when we see Macroni's incompetence, his flawed methods, um, the fact that he, he makes boastful claims that go beyond the data, whereas STIRP is much more cautious. They admit, well, this data is, is consistent with various interpretations. They use multiple tests, multiple samples, including conclusive ones to rule out certain options. I mean, it, it's just clear which, if you want to go based on scholarly credibility, Macroni is uh, sadly lacking in that department compared to these STIRP scientists. Yeah, I mean, just think about it. Macroni went through about four different versions. You know, first he thought it was a finger painting, then he stopped that, then he thought it was simply iron oxide particles that created the images. Then he added, oh, well, Jewelers Rouge was, was used. This is a version of iron oxide pigment. That's what created the shroud images. Sorry, Macroni, that was only uh, available after the year 1800. So that couldn't historically have been the, the paint. And then he's like, oh, okay, well, it was an earth iron oxide pigment, you know, the red ochre in a proteinous uh, binder. But then his own team kind of showed how foolish and he was to make these biased conclusions so quickly because they discovered vermilion with that x-ray x ray test. And um yeah, so finally he ended up with his final claim that a liquid earthy iron oxide paint was used to create the body and bloodstain images originally, plus vermilion paint was used to enhance the red color of the bloodstain subsequently. The STIRP scientists, on the other hand, have been thorough, cautious, and consistent in both the methods they employ and the conclusions that they publish. Their findings have withstood the test of time, Macronis have not. They've been thrown out by everyone, including Shroud skeptics. In closing, um, well, okay, that's not fair on this feature because I, there are Shroud skeptics alive today that still use his uh, paint, his pro-paint observation findings, but they dismiss that it was actually a painting. That, that's what I meant, so that's more fair. But yeah, you know, in closing, it, it even if it may be true that some of these tests, when considered in isolation, are not specific enough to rule out the possibility of paint being used, it remains the case that when considered cumulatively, it is simply impossible, 0% chance that all of these tests would be wrong on the question of whether or not the paints proposed by Macroni were used to create the shroud images. It's just, uh, sorry skeptics, come on. You know, you're just not reasonable at that point. Okay, um, so yeah, this is definitely going to be a long episode, one hour. I'm going to, let's go through the cumulative phase conclusions very quickly for the painting hypothesis. What what can we conclude? So, you know, I should mention, shroud skeptics have inquired as to whether a medieval artist could have painted the shroud images using a clear liquid or acidic compound rather than a foreign uh, you know, something that stained the the, um, the cloth itself rather than a foreign substance like Macroni thought. Obviously, this is outside the traditional painting hypothesis, but yeah, it's possible some artist used an acidic compound and painted the shroud's body images with this. But yeah, this, this proposal would also fail of various minimal relevant features. It wouldn't account for the superficiality, the uniformity, the three-dimensional information, our vertically mapped wrapping distortion, you know, the anatomical accuracies or the blood stains halos. It, yeah, again, th this um, acidic using acid as opposed to paint doesn't help the shroud skeptic here. It, you, you still got many of the same problems. Um, so yeah, uh, as to the traditional Macroni painting hypothesis, plausibility it is how does this um, hypothesis fare in regards to plausibility well on a theoretical level it is utterly implausible remember the notion that any artist let alone one that lived before the 20th century could come up with the idea to paint an image in a photographic negative way encoding three-dimensional information and have the necessary hand-eye brain coordination to encode vertically mapped wrapping distortions, this is sheer fantasy. It violates everything we know about the limits of human capability. It's utterly implausible. Secondly, on a practical level, there are no, zero, absolutely none other precedents in artistic history of such images being created using traditional painting techniques. Uh, the shroud images are completely unique in the entire history of art. So, you know, questions will abound. Just how would any artist be able to learn or develop the skills necessary to create or, or even conceive of such images in the first place? 
uh, let alone be able to double check or correct any mistakes in their work and, and hammer out their method in creating these images. The notion that it's just a fluke, I mean, come on, it's a ridiculous notion. Uh, the odds against that are just astronomical, especially when we when we factor in the modern scientific, you know, forensic artists using modern scientific equipment and cheating couldn't also produce uh, such images in the 20th century. So yeah, I, I think it's it's quite obvious that this this theory is implausible. You also have to ask about historical plausibility. Why didn't he pat? Why didn't he have an, an apprentice who passed on these? these remarkable techniques to, to other artists where it would spread. I mean, certainly people took interest in the shroud images. What possible motivation would this artist have to create various images, some of which were invisible, and he would have no conceivable way of, to anticipate the technology of the 19th and 20th century where we can appreciate you know, his, his serum retraction rings and stuff like that. So this, this painting theory is utterly implausible. Explanatory scope. Well, as we've seen, this painting hypothesis fails to account for several minimal relevant features. Therefore, automatically it fails to have explanatory scope. It can't account for all the data. Same with explanatory power. Well, if it fails to account for multiple minimal relevant features, it, it's, it lacks explanatory power. It fails this criterion as well. There are many elements that appear forced. There are questionable or vague and ambiguous elements. You know, for example, the superficiality or non-cementation of the, the frills and the body image areas. These are much too fine for any artist to distinguish with an unaided human eye. And since each fabril has been superficially encoded with a uniform intensity of color individually, and a painter would need to use a paintbrush with a single bristle. And even that wouldn't be good enough. It would still be, you know, that remember that sable or horsehair, the smallest or finest paint brushes are made of this, known to man, paint bristles. Even that would be thicker than a single fabril, so it's just, uh, it's so forced, it's impossible that uh, this hypothesis has the explanatory power to account for such features. Plus there are those questionable aspects, you know, like it's questionable whether an artist could create, without any precedent, uh, photographic negative images, for example. Yeah, this just appears very very questionable or, or ambiguous to me. What about the less ad hoc criterion? Well, in light of all the various tests, microscopic, spectro spectral, chemical, immunological, etc., that STIRP scientists conducted on the shroud images and non-image areas, really the simplest conclusion is that paint wasn't used to create them, but it was blood. Alan Adler, a, a shroud expert, goes on to say, you know, Maybe the shroud skeptic can rule out the negative results of each of these tests individually, but you know they can propose this various pigment compound that the test wouldn't be sensitive enough to uh, to test for, or that can you know overcome the res the negative results of a given specific given test. Nonetheless, the skeptic would quote unquote need a dozen such different compounds in order to explain what we what uh, STIRP scientists can explain with only one compound real blood. That's the difference with how science works. Skeptics, are you listening? Science. This is how science works, okay? If you tried to put those 12 to 15 compounds up um, versus the far simpler explanation of it just being real blood uh, into the scientific literature in a reference peer-reviewed academic scientific journal, it would be bounced instantly. Yeah, that that's the difference with science, okay? Shroud skeptics, you, you need to learn how science works and it's just obvious that the simpler explanation here is that it's blood. It's not, you can't postulate, well, 12 or 15 different pigments in order to com combat all of these various spectral and chemical tests that prove it's not paint. You know, again, Alan Adler goes on and says, even if one claims that it, as it has been done in non-convincing studies, and by that he means not published in peer review literature, that some of these tests are not specific enough individually, it is simply impossible, 0%, for all these tests to be wrong together. The only possible conclusion is that blood on the shroud is real, old, denatured human blood and not paint. That This, by far, is the simplest explanation. Yeah, I, I, try, I keep hammering home that that point because that's an important point that I want you guys to get. There's also another glaring ad hoc component to this painting hypothesis of Macroni's and it's the non-evidenced assumption that Macroni just 
says, well, this alleged medieval artist used a heavily diluted mixture, completely unprecedented, never heard of before, of a 0.01% solution of iron oxide in a 0.01% gelatin binding medium solution. This makes the predominant ingredient essentially water in making the shroud images. This, this notion is ludicrous and extremely ad hoc. We have no evidence at all historically that anyone would ever consider using such a medieval period. So that's an ad hoc component that I think makes this theory improbable, the painting hypothesis improbable. Finally, we have illumination. And here the painting hypothesis does a little better. It, it would illuminate secondary details such as that memorandum from Bishop Pierre d'Arcis. Yep, if the painting theory was true, it would make, oh, okay, this explains why Pierre d'Arcis said he had an artist telling, confessing to making a cunningly devised thing. Obviously, it, it's controversial as to whether this memorandum is complete rubbish made up and lied uh, and lies by the bishop because he was greedy for money. But still, it, this is data. We have this memorandum and the painting hypothesis would illuminate and make sense of that, that data. Uh, it would also illuminate the uh, carbon-14 dating, but that's not an established secondary fact. That's controversial, as, as I proved in part one. So, so yeah, I, I would assign the painting hypothesis a neutral status. If you want to be generous, you could give it a pass on this bonus illumination criterion. But, um, yeah, with that, I think we're done. We're at the hour and a half, one hour, half hour mark. So, yeah, that, that's the painting hypothesis, guys. I, I think it's improbable. It, in fact, I think it's impossible that the traditional painting hypothesis suggested by Macroni is true. You know, what, what do you guys think? It, it, I'll leave it with you guys, and I'll provide the sources. So thanks for listening, and um, next time in part nine, we'll move on to our next image-forming mechanism, which is a little bit more credible, um, but still a, an utter failure, and that's uh, powder rubbing or dusting hypotheses, you know, the, as advanced by skeptics like Joe Nickel and Craig, uh, Craig and Berizzi and also Luigi Garlicelli more recently. Uh, so yeah, that's the plan for next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.